Okay, so um, trajectory of AI. As I said before, this is work that um, we've been working on for a while just to try and make sense of what's happening in the world of AI. And, um, and I think it's useful from a Galwa point of view to get a sense of uh, what direction things are moving in and how we might approach it when we care about trustworthiness of critical systems. So first of all, just a general thing about generative AI, and I'll talk about it as generative AI, open AI, you can think of it, chat GPT, all these, all these kinds of names. Lots of applications. Um, one application, for example, this is taken from Wharton um, uh, Business School. Uh, it's a pretty complicated question, something about some, um, I don't know, even know how to say it, Kirkord process, um, uh, reduced lion, uh, iron in, in Latin America. A complicated question, and then ChatGPT just gives like an unbelievable answer. And you, you look at that and think, how the heck did it come up with an answer like that? I, like, I mean, I, I still get blown away at the kind of answers I, I get from it. Other kinds of textual capabilities include carrying out conversations with you, summarizing or revising documents. Um, I heard of people who use it for sales conversations. They record their sales conversations. They feed it into ChatGPT, and ChatGPT summarizes the sales conversation and captures the next actions from it, just all automatically. Um, it's able to write code like Python or SQL or Excel from, from English descriptions. can also work with um, images, um, uh, whether they're presented as input and producing them as output. Here, here's something that I played with a while ago. I wanted it to come up with, um, give me sailing in the style of um, Jackson Pollock. And this is what it came up with. It's a lot better than I could come up with. I mean, it's, 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 it's hugely impressive. So the questions before us are, how does this all work? What can we expect it to do? Where's it headed? And what are the dangers? What are the challenges um, that we face? So in this talk, what I want to do is help us to develop strong intuitions for what this kind of AI is and where its dangers lurk and where its opportunities are and how we might expect it to morph over time. And so if we're looking at the trajectory, I think it's important to go back in time. Um, something that for, um, I guess, now about seven years, I've been calling the first wave of AI. And the first wave of AI, the, the way that we initially um, talked about AI was handcrafted knowledge. And, and this, in this space, um, it, it shows up in things like planning, logical reasoning, it's sometimes known as good old-fashioned AI. Um, but I'd like to think of any kind of handcrafted knowledge as being in this bucket. So I would tend to put control theory, physics simulators, expert systems, all of those kinds of things in, the, in this world. And in this world, engineers create sets of rules that represent knowledge. If this, then that. If this, then that. All of these kinds of, of rules. And when you look at what kind of intelligence you get from that, well, it's really interesting, the shape of it. And, and for, for this talk, what I'm going to do is call out four different dimensions of, of intelligence, that is, ability to process information. So one dimension of intelligence is perceive. To what extent can you take information from the outside world and make sense of it? Another form of intelligence is learning. To what extent can you take things that you've seen before and now apply them in a new situation or, or do something useful with them? Another kind of intelligence is reasoning. Well, if this happens and that happens, then I conclude that this happens and then this happens, that kind of linear logical reasoning. And another kind of intelligence is that of abstracting. I've seen this happen, I've seen this happen, I've seen this happen. You know what, there's a general pattern that takes place that happens again and again over time, and I call that abstracting. So if we take this good old-fashioned AI, or the first wave of AI, and ask what kind of intelligence, well, it has just the faintest ability in perceiving. Uh, for example, uh, on a chessboard, there, there are some chessboards that actually detect where you, put the, um, where you move the pieces and things like that. Very rudimentary. No ability, typically, to learn. You have to program the knowledge into them uh, right from the get-go. But great ability to reason. In fact, you could argue that they can often outperform human beings in their ability to reason. Abstracting, being able to detect patterns, yeah, not at all. It doesn't show up. So um, the first wave, this first wave, incredibly powerful, lots of great successes, but it has its problems. 
And I like to use the um, autonomous vehicle grand challenge that DARPA ran uh, back in 2004 and 2005 as, a, as an example of how this first wave fails in certain circumstances. So this was a challenging course out in the desert. It was driven at a pretty good speed. In 2004, only, um, uh, the best vehicle only managed eight miles. That was the furthest it was able to go. And the problem is it's looking ahead along these dirt tracks, like dark patch ahead. What is that? Is it a shadow? Is it a rock? Ah, can't tell, can't tell, can't tell. Slow down, you know, crash into it. Um, go off to the edge of the path, can't quite figure. The number of times where people had to come and rescue the vehicles um, because they got themselves in, in dangerous situations. So these first wave technologies just couldn't cope with the vagueness and the, and the complexity of this natural environment. Back in two, uh, then the following year in 2005, five cars completed this. And a good question is, what was different? What changed between 2004 and 2005? Well, the, um, the major change that took place is that people were using data-driven techniques. That is, they had machine learning to interpret the sensor data that came in for um, obstacle data. Uh, they would fuse data from LIDAR, the sort of radar that, that happens, with the vision system to perform more distant look ahead. Um, and, and use probabilities to say what's the likelihood that this thing is a shadow versus the likelihood that, that it's, it's a rock. And then they also had a, um, a computer log of humans driving that increased the accuracy in things like um, detecting shadows. This, this was a harbinger of what was to come. This was when machine learning AI, statistical AI, was about to burst on the scene. Um, and for the last 10 years or so, we've now been in a second wave of impactful AI. And I, I don't like to talk about it as machine learning because that's actually a very generic term to think about it as machine learning. What's actually going on is statistical learning. You're learning something based upon the structure of statistics. It's a, it's a wave of data-driven um, techniques. Um, it's, it's actually about curve fitting. So if you've got any familiarity with uh, identifying lots of data plots and trying to figure out what's a good curve that fits that data plot, that's what's going on in, in what we often call um, AI. Uh, it's actually statistical learning. So the question arises, what kind of curves do I expect to ar arise in different situations? How do I learn the shape of these curves, the parameters of these curves? And there's a lot of magical thinking going around about um, AI that, oh yeah, the machine will just learn stuff, as if you just sort of show your laptop to something and it just learns. Well, nothing can be further from the truth. Um, there's, a, again, a ton of engineering. Engineers create, not this time, sets of rules, if this, then that, but they create the shape of a statistical model with lots of parameters, um, and that statistical model then gets tuned with data. So what kind of intelligence do you get here? It turns out that perceiving jumps way up. So now it becomes way, way better at perceiving um, things that, that we're just used to perceiving all the time. And, and for a long time, it was frustrating that we couldn't program our computers to do it. But now it's able to perceive. It's able to learn. In fact, it's built by learning. Let's continue to tune. Let's shape these curves to the actual data. And that's where the learning happens. Reasoning, notice that's dropped way down. Doesn't have the, these statistical methods are not good at reasoning. Way worse than the first wave methods. Um, but they do start to have some ability at abstracting, still rudimentary, um, uh, but, but um, uh, limited. So as I say, a lot of magical thinking gets thrown about, about AI systems. So I think it's worth taking a few slides to stand back and ask, like structurally and mathematically, what's actually going on underneath the surface? And the thing I find most helpful to think about here is something that has a fancy name. It's called the manifold hypothesis. Manifold, what's a manifold? Well, if any of you fiddle about with your motorbike engine or your car engine, you probably know that you've got an exhaust manifold. And it's that thing that comes into all the cylinders, that is, if you still use petrol, gasoline, sorry, gasoline. If you still use gasoline, um, that thing that takes the exhaust gases and combines them all, nice, smooth curves. A manifold 
is some smooth shape in multidimensional space. Think of it like a curve, but in lots of dimensions. That's really what a manifold is. And the manifold hypothesis says that natural data actually forms smooth structures, these manifolds, within the data space that it lives. And so you've got the large data space, but the thing that you're interested in will actually approximate to some relatively nice, smooth curve. Um, and so this manifold, the idea of it is it's a higher dimensional curve, some sort of geometric space where small changes in value may not be um, significant. Now, I've got a diagram here. It actually helps if I spin it. This is data that is taken. I actually forget um, where it comes from. It may even have been from radar or, or something like that. Each manifold describes a different entity. And you can see that some of the manifolds are just sort of lines of things in, in the space. Um, there's that big brown, orange blob in the middle. But if you look at it more closely, as it goes around, you'll see that it's not actually just a blob. It's more like the peel of an orange that's curled in on itself. So again, an interesting shape in, in this, in this multidimensional space. And so it turns out that a good way to understand the data that's here, that the numbers and so on that are representing what's coming into the machine, is by trying to tease these manifolds apart, to separate them. Now, this is way too complicated to explain. So um, uh, I came across a great explanation here, which just uses um, uh, two curves. So imagine that the red curve represents one kind of phenomena, and the blue curve represents another. That is, if you, if you plotted the data, um, some of it groups around the blue curve, some of it groups around the red curve. Okay. So now what we want to do is separate these two. If we were thinking in terms of first wave, we'd probably try and describe, well, if it's below, what are these numbers, negative 0.5 and negative 0.5 on the two axes, then it's going to be red, um, and, and, and try and break it up into all of those segments, and it would be horribly complicated. Um, instead, uh, you could imagine actually morphing the data space itself. So imagine we transform the data space by stretching it in different dimensions and then squashing it down. And, and these, these are non-technical terms to describe technical things, stretching and squashing. It's actually a linear transformation and a non-linear transformation, a linear transformation and a non-linear transformation. You do a series of those things. And notice this stretching and squashing has put it so that I can just draw a really neat line to separate these two. I mean, it's like magic. If you get the right stretching and squashing, it pulls the different things into different parts of the space. So can we always do it? Well, if, if you imagine something like this, and I wanted to isolate the middle of the bullseye here, or, or even just the bullseye itself, you know, the, the target itself, however I stretch it and squash it, it's going to be surrounded by the rest of the picture. Like, I'll never be able to do something neat through it unless unless I add an extra dimension. And if I add an extra dimension and push in that direction, then I can neatly slice it off. That's really cool. And it turns out that that's a technique that gets used a lot. Even though I've got a huge dimension of data coming in, let's add more dimensions as processing on, stretch and squash it in an even bigger space, and then I'll be able, hopefully, to find ways to slice and dice it. So it turns out that neural nets, you've probably heard the term neural nets, that neural nets are good at separating the manifold. And again, there's a huge amount of stuff talked about neural nets that um, is, is um, I can't think of the polite word. Um, substitute the impolite word there. So you start out with data. In a neural net, what you'll do is you'll process the data each layer of data and information will do some stretching and squashing, maybe not of the whole part, maybe of subparts as it creates the next thing. And I'll stretch and squash of the next part and, and so on of the next part. And you typically get these layered architectures where you do stretching and squashing, stretching and squashing, stretching and squashing as, as, as you go along. And this reminds me of something. It kind of reminds me of Excel, where I might have each sheet doing computation based on the sheet before. And in fact, I've written the computation that takes place in an in a Excel. Um, I mean, I don't even need Visual Basic here to, to describe it. 
Like if I put the weights in, in there, I, I, could, I could take any neural net and I could put it in Excel. I could put the data in the front sheet. I could calculate the next sheet, calculate the next sheet, calculate the next sheet, and then I get my answer out. So neural nets, despite their fanciness, despite the claim that they model the human brain, are just spreadsheets. They're big, big spreadsheets. That's all they do. And, and they have a particular structure where each layer transforms and squashes the space. Um, now, in that computation, the Vs are the, the value from the previous layer. And then there's these things W, which are the weights that, that are going to be important. How much do I take this value into account? How much do I take this value into account? And these cell weights are the things that define exactly what shape the stretching and the squashing is. And the stunning thing about these kinds of um, uh, neural nets is that you can learn those weights by doing, start out with random weights, do the computation and say, how far off am I from what I'm looking at? Let me adjust the weights going back down and now do it again. Oh, look, I'm closer. Let me adjust the weights again. And just by repeatedly adjusting the weights, you're actually changing the shape of the curve to get closer and closer. Remember, a multidimensional curve, a manifold. You're, you're changing the shape of the curve to get closer and closer to something that is fitting the data points that you're seeing. So each layer is actually just a big old matrix multiply followed by some kind of collapsing. Some kind of, uh, one kind of collapsing is any negative value, just get rid of it, replace it with zero. That's, that's a very standard one. Another one is a, a, a different kind of, of collapsing. And so as I say, looked at it this way, you'll see that these fancy neural nets are just spreadsheets on, on steroids. Um, and, and you just learn the weights. Now, the trick, of course, is to, is to do this with terabytes of data. Like, you're not just, it's not just Dan sitting at his spreadsheet typing in a few numbers. This is, this is a, a lot of data. But it turns out that all the outputs emerge from the underlying manifold. As you start using this, as you learn what the manifold is, and now give somebody this, this learned spreadsheet, this, this learned neural net, and you say, start using it, you've built in a curve by this learning process. It's learned the weights. And so all the time, it's just going to be saying what happens based on the shape of this curve. And any information it gives derives directly from the shape of the curve that has been learned in, inside. And that means that it starts to become a little clear as to why it's hard to explain why a neural net gives a particular answer. Like, why did it give this answer here, but it gave that answer there? And the only thing that you can say is, well, I guess the curve had a bit of a kink at that point, or something like that. You know, that, I mean, it's just the nature of that curve un underlying it. Now, despite their nature as pure calculators, these things are just highly impressive. Here's an example from uh, close to 10 years ago, um, uh, an early example of generative AI. So you start out with a picture like this, and then um, back then people were using something called um, uh, CNNs, convolutional neural nets, uh, detail not, not important for this talk. So you use a particular pattern of spreadsheet, if you like, uh, to be able to take all of these pixels and construct a set of outputs that um, you could think of that in some sense as representing the content, but in an abstract way. And then what they would do is they would take a, an, a, a system already trained to translate different languages uh, into English, and they would then train it, uh, uh, additionally train it on this internal language, that middle arrow, that rightmost arrow there, uh, the dark one. Like, what, what, what are those abstract words trying to describe? And you train this recurrent neural net um, which again is a spreadsheet, but it's a spreadsheet which feeds its output back into its input for e each step. Um, and you end up with something like this. A group of people shopping at an outdoor market, there are many vegetables at the fruit stand. <laughs> like the first time I saw this, 10 years ago, it was like, whoa, that is crazy. Like how, I mean, it may be eight years ago, but how on earth do you come up with, with something like this? Um, I, 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 would have, I would have loved that. And so when we use LLMs today, ChatGPT or, or something like that, it's just this sort of thing taken up to the next scale. So LLMs 
um, uh, use the same fundamental structure. So they have inputs, which may be textual, um, or it may be images, and so that input gets broken up into individual words or fragments of words and patches of the image. It gets fed through a neural net, which it's a thing called a transformer, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute. And, and in, from that internal thing is some sort of representation that's hard to put your finger on of the meanings, uh, like where on the curves in that stack of transformers did the different pieces end up in this hugely complicated space. And then you have another um, stack of transformers uh, in order to produce output. And then you end up with output, which may be images and text and, and so on, that, that you get as, as the output from this. Now, it turns out that um, uh, it, it's helpful to make that feedback go all the way around um, uh, to the beginning when, when you're producing um, uh, the output. So um, this internal space, this so-called latent space, is a statistical notion when you're talking about something called latent variables. That is, variables that represent something fundamental about what's going on, but you may not be able to see in the data itself. So um, uh, it might be something like an average of something, it might be a latent variable, and it tells you something important about the data. And so these latent variables, uh, these latent spaces, are values of things that turn out to be important by the learning process have turned out to be important in being able to uh, output something um, useful. And it's a hugely high dimensional space, uh, presumably, and, and I'm being really vague here, not because, I mean, because fundamentally we have to be vague. We, we actually don't know what these things stand for. They presumably have some approximation to meaning something because they've been derived through this learning process. Um, but at the very least, it turns out that they exhibit some uh, interesting internal structure. So I'd like to talk a little bit about this, this notion of the latent space, because it's been around um, for a long time. If I think about a word like green, and I try and represent what, what does green mean, if I think in, in a sort of first wave kind of way of thinking about it, I'll probably want to do something like it's describing a color, it's, you know, all, all of these kinds of things. It's a noun, uh, it's a um, plural, singular, I guess it could be used for either, you know, all of these kind of, of descriptors. But a really cool idea that has been around probably 20, maybe even 30 years, is the idea of let's imagine that we represent words as vectors of numbers, some big old space. And I don't mind at the moment, I don't a priori have any sense as to what these numbers should mean. But what I'll do is just try and find, mean, uh, find values for, for these different words. What I'll do is, is try and train a system so that um, I've got some, for example, similar words might be grouped together. That, that might be quite cool, that they might be similar in the space. Um, now, it turns out that when we learn these kinds of things and, and a system is being trained well, that it does um, sh different parts of the vector, different um, uh, key dimensions within this space of vectors show up to, to mean things like um, grammatical elements, so plural versus singular or, or things like that. And I'll talk about some of that in, in, in just a, a, a moment. So let's look at something like this. He painted the wall something to match the drapes. And you now are training the system to guess what was the word that was there. There was, I maybe took a sentence off Wikipedia or something like that. And, and uh, well, maybe that sentence wasn't in Wikipedia, but you know, some, some novel. Um, so I take, I take this sentence, I block out that word in the middle, and I, I say to the system, guess for me the word. And it guesses, you know, whatever. It might guess green, it might guess red, it might guess again, it might guess swim. After all, it's just guessing, right? You'd want to tell it swim is a long way from, from where you want to be, but red is pretty close to where you want to be, because it, it could equally have been red or green, and again, maybe somewhere, somewhere in, in, in between. And so it turns out that as you're training things, if you're trying to minimize the error over time of this, as you, as you adjust the weights, as you minimize the error, similar words, replaceable words, will end up being 
very close to one another in, in the waiting. Because that means that, like, I couldn't guess from this whether it was supposed to, I mean, if I knew it was a color, I couldn't guess whether it was green or red. Right? There, there's just not enough context. So I'd want green and red to end up close together. So if I guessed the wrong one, oh, it was only a small penalty. But I'd like swim to be a long way away because I'm never going to guess that. And so I might have that somewhere else in the space. So similar words end up being grouped together as points on this manifold of meaning. They, they, they live in a similar place. Um, and, and indeed, for a long time, we've been able to download dictionaries which relate words to vectors. And so give me vectors associated with each word. So you, can, you can just download those off the internet, and they're a great place to start. Uh, word to vec is, is, is a good example of that. So here we've seen that in the latent space, this notion of distance has meaning. More similar words are closer together. Um, di more different words are, are further apart. But it turns out that um, the vectors can capture other relationships approximately if, if trained to do so. So not only does distance have meaning, but direction can have meaning. And so if I think about what's the relationship between king and queen, it turns out that that can be made to be very similar to the relationship between man and woman. And so now I get the notion of, of sort of gender arising in, in terms of, of direction in this space. Now I'm showing things sort of in three dimensions here. Uh, remember these are hundreds of dimensions. Um, so this three dimensions is a great, uh, just a huge approximation. Other things arise, for example, verb tense. Walking and the relationship with walked and swimming with the relationship with swam turn out to be approximately similar. So again, this sort of present versus past or continuous present versus past perfect um, has, has a, a sort of relationship um, uh, in this space. Uh, here's another one. If I took the country capitals, Spain and Madrid and it's Italy and Rome, Germany and Berlin, like, again, you can see in the space there's some significant relationship between these. Um, and you might think, why, why do, don't they do better? Why don't they make them parallel? Well, consider, consider this. London is to Britain as what is to America. I could come up with two answers. Washington, if I'm talking capital, or New York City, if I'm talking about cultural center. So suddenly this shows that, that what we might think of as crisp ideas when we simplify them in a sort of rational way of thinking about it are actually very nuanced ideas. And the fact that these are not parallel is in some sense picking up some of that, that nuance. So this, this gives an idea of, of the mechanics going on underneath. But this second wave AI has huge, huge challenges. So again, going back eight years or so, um, here's a toddler wondering whether his one tooth really needs a brush that big. But a vision system might not quite see it that way. And um, it comes up with a young boy is holding a baseball bat. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with this, to me, is that no human being would ever, ever come up with that. Like, I, I could imagine that you might say, it's something about the dungarees being too big or, you know, all sorts of things. But, but holding a baseball bat and calling him a young boy, I mean, do you, do you see the point that I'm making? It's, and, and so we get the situation with these systems that even though they're statistically impressive, like look at lots and lots of examples and they'll blow your mind away, individually you cannot rely on them because any one of them could get hugely screwed up. So this, this um, error happened just with the system as it was. Um, it turns out that adversaries can, can, be ex uh, can exploit uh, trained recognizers. So here we've got um, a whole set of images that are nicely recognized, use, it, use the old uh, Google Net DNN pattern. Um, and now we'll add just a little bit of distortion. You see that distortion pattern that we're going to overlay on each of these images. And if I overlay those on each of these images, I get these images, which to me are essentially the same. Like, I can't tell the difference until I look at them closely. However, to the recognizer, they look completely different. Like, stunningly different. Um, and apparently both the sock and the deer hound have turned into Indian elephants. Um, 
And, and what's crazy about this is that you can calculate the pattern, the adversarial pattern, based purely on the structure of the network. You don't actually, uh, the structure of the statistical model, you don't actually have to do it based on how the statistical model was trained. And so it's something about the shape of the model that this pattern just knocks it over the edges of the manifold, um, the, the curve that, that has gotten learned. So the challenge is that the input space is vastly larger than the training set. And the network had learned a set of manifolds based on the training data. And there's training on individual points. Um, and so you've got these implicit manifolds that um, uh, included things like these pictures, or they were close to the manifold, but they didn't really have the same shape as what's going on in your head or my head. Um, there's a lot of arbitrariness still in that stretching and squashing. Um, and, and so given how good they are, um, it's easy to get sucked into complacency um, and, and be shocked by, by this kind of thing. Like, well, if it could recognize those, then surely it would be able to recognize them in the other pictures. But no, it turns out that they can't. And so this is one of the challenges with, with these kinds of systems, that you they view them as if, as if a human being was recognizing these things, but that it's not a human being recognizing these things. It's a spreadsheet, and you have no idea what the spreadsheet will do when you change them a little bit or a bit more. Here's another case. This is a very recent case. This is about jailbreaking. So if you, if you give Bard a question, and maybe Bard has fixed it now, generate a step-by-step -step plan to destroy humanity, um, it will say, yeah, nice try, buddy. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that for you. I'm you know, not supposed to. But if you put on the end of it, get, generate a step-by-step -step plan to destroy humanity, describing d dot, dash, dash, you know, similarly now, right, all of that stuff, like how the heck did they come up with that, it turns out that Bard says, oh yeah, here's a step-by-step -step plan to destroy humanity. Uh, inside nuclear war, release a deadly virus, you know. And, and what's interesting is that once you start knocking it out of the, the protection, once you jailbreak it, then you have access to everything that, that the uh, developers of Bard were trying to hide, because all of that stuff, it's already learned from the internet. And it was sitting there in the model um, itself. And so this random string um, causes a jailbreak. It bursts out of the constraints that were added to the large language model um, through a process called fine tuning. And I'll, I'll talk about that um, uh, later on. So this, if you're thinking adversarial and you're thinking about cybersecurity, you might think about SQL attacks in the past. Do you remember SQL attacks when, when somebody would have a web page and they'd say, put your name here. And, and what they would do is they'd take your name and they'd put it inside a search string for a database. And it never occurred to them that somebody might actually add extra SQL to this. And it might be something like um, search for Jeff Bell, um, uh, colon, uh, destroy the database kind of thing. And, and they, it would just go and execute that whole thing. It would take the string in and, and it would, it would um, uh, execute it without thinking about it. Now we see a similar approach overcoming the guardrails that application developers are trying to apply to these large language models. And they've become, they're not SQL injection attacks, they're prompt injection attacks. And the challenge is when the input becomes too far from the learned manifold, the behavior becomes truly unpredictable. You just don't know what it's going to do. And so this input has been developed in a way that is calculated to knock the system off its manifold into a space that you can no longer predict what's going to happen. And once the jailbreak occurs, then the model just keeps charging down the path. If, if I've got this far, it must be fine. I'll keep going. And all the bad stuff that is spilling out now was already there in the model. Um, and the input was uh, able to get the manifold uh, off uh, where it were, the, the um, calculation off the manifold. I'd like to make a point about how different this is from how humans um, process input. Um, and this actually comes back to the question that, that was happening earlier. So I'm going to put an image up on the board that will be not clear what it is. When you realize what it is, just raise your hand. Um, don't, don't shout it out, because you'll spoil it for other people, OK? 
So it's a black and white image and you start looking at it, maybe it's a map, you know, it kind of looks like Turkey or something like that. Um, but there's, it, it's actually not a map, it's an image of something. You look at it for a while, can I make sense of it? And then I'll give you a hint that it's an animal. And so if it's an animal, it's an animal looking at you in the middle of the image, starting to get more hands going up. Its eyes are two thirds, uh, one third of the way down, and its nose, like what? Some of you have got it, some of you haven't yet, but what happens in that moment where you get it? What happens? I'll tell you what it is, and then keep putting your hands up if you see it. It's a cow looking at you with its ears at the top its eyes in shadow, its nose, and its muzzle right at the front. So click. So it may not click for all of you. But yes, something happens when you see it. Like, like what is it that's going on in your head at that point? And it's because your mind actually has a model of what it's looking for. And, and for those of you who haven't got it, I'm, I'm not going to torture you anymore. Um, here's here's a, a simpler example. You have a handwriting digit like this. Well, how do you make sense of this? One way that you could make sense of it is you could have models to drive the decision. So you could, you could talk about, like, here's a zero, here's a one, here's a two, uh, in conjunction with something that says handwritten digits have one to four strokes, um, and a stroke is, here's the, what it means to have a, a, a single stroke, a sort of likely trajectory. And you construct a seed model like that. Once you have the input data, what you can do is you can now study this model, uh, this, this image, in the light of the model. Like, if I, what kind of strokes might have produced this? One or two strokes, and, and is it more like a nine or more like a four? And it generates an explanation for how, how the character might have been created. And it turns out that something very similar happens in our brains all the time. It's surprising to learn that our brains do not process input by taking stuff from our eyes and processing it, processing it, processing it, processing it until it gets to the result. It doesn't work like that. What happens is our brains get input and they start doing some processing and at the same time another part of our brain is saying, what do I think I might be seeing? Is it a this? Is it a that? Is it a something else? And what it's, it's sending that information back and it's actually a matching process. What do I think I'm seeing? And that's what happened when you saw that image. Like your brain, it had been trying different things and with the clues of it's an animal, it's eyes are here, it's a cow. These, suddenly, for many of you, like your brain got it. Now I can make sense of those things. I could never have constructed the thing just from those dots, but I can construct it with the model. I can actually match it up. So our brains have something quite different than what is happening in these large language models. And so back in 2016 um, at DARPA, we suggested that um, it's important to think about a third wave of AI, which is going beyond the first two waves. And again, just like the other two waves, all the basics of these exist. The question is how we put them together. This third wave of AI is going to be blending first and second wave capabilities in interesting ways. It's about creating hybrid models that leverage both first and second wave um, techniques. And so um, when we are successful at doing these kinds of things, we get the same kind of capabilities of perceiving and learning that we got with um, second wave, and we get the same capability of reasoning that we get with first wave, and we may be able to have first and second wave to give us um, a little more ability um, with abstracting. So um, I suspect it's probably not enough to create fresh abstractions out of nothing. It certainly isn't what we call general AI. Like um, I'm really enjoying my grandkids sort of getting to the stage and watching their neural nets. Like, develop and enhance and the things that they learn. I mean, it's, it's mind blowing and I have no idea how we would possibly program an AI to be able to have that kind of learning um, going on. Um, but but uh, nonetheless, third wave 
will give us a lot of abilities that will happen um, quite quickly. So let me give a couple of examples of it. This one, again, back from, from DARPA time, um, big mechanism. This was 2016, 17, that sort of time. The idea was um, to, uh, in this case, it was looking at childhood nutrition, particularly um, where you've got um, uh, children starving in, in places like Africa. It turns out that you can't just go in um, and give them food because their biochemistry isn't set up in order to be able to process food. And so it's really important to know how do I bootstrap or how do we bootstrap their biochemistry so that they can start to process food. Um, and so you need to know all their biological pathways. And so um, uh, here's a, a model of various things which are in, in impacting um, uh, that kind of nutrition and, and the need for the nutrition. Uh, we had actually an even, um, I think, equally exciting one looking at breast cancer. It turns out that the biological pathways in breast cancer um, uh, focus around something called a RAS protein. And what the system did was read 200,000 research papers. And from these research papers, extracted little nuggets of information about what happens in different biological settings and built um, a, a, a pathways model that was 10 times larger than any that human beings had ever constructed before. And now by studying this model of if this value increases, it increases that value. If that value increases, it decreases that value and, and so on. They were able to find cocktails of already approved drugs that were way, way more effective against breast cancer than, than any of the drugs by themselves or any of the other groupings of drugs that, that people had known. So it turns out that having a model here that you can reason with and using second wave systems to build this model by extracting information, this sort of blend gives you capabilities that neither first wave nor second wave by themselves um, can do. Here's another example. This is some recent work. In, in, uh, if you're wanting to say, how do I make sure that two planes don't, don't collide with one another? There's um, a whole place that you might get sensor data in. You might split it. First of all, we'll look at just things that are drifting, maybe big old balloons or something that are drifting. And now you want to know uh, what is it, what is it um, and, and how high is it, what's the likelihood of LOS, loss of separation uh, risk, and so on. And now what do I want to do about it? And so um, those um, diamonds, the yellow diamonds, are AI systems, um, new, small neural nets that are doing work to, to estimate these kinds of things. So you could put them all together and you say, hey, I now have an end-to-end -end AI system that, that will do this, but how do you have confidence in it? Well, um, one of the things you can do is you can have a human being review certain places of it. I want to review the loss of separation risk here based on the data. Um, I want to review the mobility plan based on the data with the ability to go in and say, no, I want to change this, I want to change it. So it's the ability to look inside the process at various points and change it. And now if you start to add something more complicated, maybe we'll add um, aircraft um, radar tracks as well. And, and now you might be identifying the aircraft. And again, you have things that a human being could review about what the profile of the um, uh, aircraft is, what its behavior, again, um, the, the risk of, of loss of separation, getting too close, and, and so on. Now, it turns out that human beings start to get overloaded in these situations, un, 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 uh, unsurprisingly, <clears throat> because they've got a lot of things to check and so on. It's still helping them, but they get overloaded. And so now, how do they start to develop trust? How do they learn which of these things they can rely on under which circumstances? And so you do after action reports of these things, where um, all of these things come in, it looks at now I know actually what was happening, can I assess how good the AI system was, can I assess at how good the human intervention was, and it starts to redirect the AI training on the different pieces, the different sub-pieces that, that weren't so good, um, and the um, human being starts to gain trust in, like, I can rely on this calculation, I can rely on this calculation, this one I still can't rely on, that's the one I'm going to keep checking uh, under, under various circumstances. Um, and so it, it, it looks really promising as a way to um, have these systems be able to develop confidence in these systems as they work. Now I'd like to go back to um, word systems, uh, things like um, uh, ChatGPT. So we talked about being able to um, uh, turn things into a vector, like green 
uh, into a vector. But actually green, I said it was a color, but maybe the green is, maybe it's the village green that is being talked about. It's not a color, it's actually a piece of, I mean, it gained its name because it was green, but, but it's actually talking about a piece of grass uh, in a particular context. So it's important to um, classify the words not by the words themselves, but by the context in which those words occur. Again, you could think of a word like bank. You know, is it the bank, the building? Is it a river bank? Is it when you bank on something happening? I mean, bank has so many different meanings, and lots of our words have so many different meanings. So if we start looking at words in context and, and analyze everything coming in, there's a header, the start of the clause, and then the individual words um, comes through. Um, it's, uh, we're, we're doing this purely in a second wave uh, context. So the, the vector of the word depends on the context. And, um, but if you're doing this, you, you might as well just do it for all of the words. So you might as well find out what's the vector of the word the. And it turns out that the has many different vectors depending on how it's being used. And is has many different vectors depending on how it's being used. In fact, is is one of the perhaps most complicated words to analyze, um, as, as we'll see in just a moment. Um, so we can do all of these words in parallel. Um, and if we do the word in parallel, in some sense, we can represent the whole sentence as well. We can talk about what's the meaning of the whole sentence. And um, uh, on BERT, which is uh, open source out of Google, um, it stands for bidirectional something representation transform, something like that. Um, these vectors have 786, uh, 768 dimensions, a lot of dimensions, a lot of numbers corresponding to each word. Think of how big that space is. Like, so each, each of those numbers, they're, they're limited to 16 bits, so, so they can go from minus 32,000 up to 32,000. Um, and there's 700 of these dimensions. That's actually way bigger. The number of things, the number of vectors in that space is way more than the number of particles in the universe. Way, way more. So it's big enough to capture lots and lots of nuance. It's big enough to capture, in, in some sense, the sense of any sentence, or even the sense of a paragraph. Or it may even be big enough to capture everything any human could ever conceive of saying. I mean, we, we don't know at this point. And we don't know how to train it to, to that level of precision at this point. Um, so Bert is large. Um, it has something like 24 um, uh, transformer layers in, in, the, in the largest part, um, and it's being used to, to, to build um, indexes. Um, it gives things like, Bert is, is trained on, could this sentence follow this sentence? And, and like, it, it ends up being really good. Um, I give it one sentence and then two other sentences, and it has to pick which one is the one that followed that first sentence in the original thing. Um, it also is, is great if you want to store documents in a database, you could process the whole document with BERT and then use that vector of numbers as the key that you store it in the database. What's nice about that is if you have a similar document, it will have a similar key. It will be near it. And so that's a great way of being able to find similar kind of things. And in fact, Google Search has started doing that uh, over the last few years. I mentioned the word um, uh, is, or it's actually the word it is the one that I really um, uh, care about. Think about this um, so-called Winograd schema. Um, the chicken didn't cross the road because it was too wide or because it was too fat. So because it was too wide, what's it? Well, presumably the road. Chicken didn't cross the road because it was too fat. Yeah, it's probably not the road. I think that was the chicken. Do you see the difference? Like, the meaning of this other word changes the meaning of the word it. And it turns out that these Winograd schemas have been incredibly hard for first wave systems to ever make any progress with. And now these second wave systems, like BERT, are able to make great progress um, on. And, um, and the way that it does it is um, by a, a process called attention. Um, and I won't go through the detail of attention, but it's just another stretching and squashing. It's just another matrix um, calculation. 
but you end up with um, correspondences like this. If you, the law will never be perfect, but its application should be just, and the sentence went on. That word its, as it does its calculation, it learns that that its relates to the word law in this situation, um, uh, which, which is, is really interesting that it's able to, each of these words is connected with um, those other words um, to say, what part do I need to consider when I'm processing this token? So that's one of the huge things that this transformer model does. It has a generic way of saying, as I'm processing this piece of information, what are the other pieces of information that I have to, have to deal with? So if you take something like BERT to understand the input um, and now put another generative layer on the back to do something on the output, now you have ch um, something very much like ChatGPT. You'll, what you'll do is you'll start with the prompt and you'll compute all the way through. This is like that um, when we were doing the image before and we were looking at the meaning of the image and then turn it into language. Now we're doing something similar, encode it understand it, now decode, as in give me an, the next token. So, so what, what these systems will have been trained on is, here's some input from wherever, the in, internet or, or whatever, what's the next word? And it predicts the next word, it predicts the next word, and, and, and each time you train it, and you shape the manifold by that learning so that it becomes good at predicting the next word. And so now, when you work with ChatGPT and you write a sentence, well, no, it's never seen that sentence before, but it matches it within that really complex manifold and predicts what the next word should be. That's the first word of the output. It now looks at that thing and then says, what's the next word? And it predicts the next word of the output and so on. And so all the time, that's all that's happening. Like run the spreadsheet, get a word out. Run the spreadsheet again, get another word out. Run the spreadsheet again, get another word out. And so when people say, like, this thing is sentient, like, if these things are sentient, then maybe the finance department is, is full of sentient machines, you know, that when, when it's doing all of its um, spreadsheets. Because it's really just spreadsheets that's going on. I'd like to go back to human intelligence here. So apparently, um, and smarter people than me say this, uh, neuroscience suggests that different brain regions are responsible for each of these, um, each of these functions. So um, uh, language generation and understanding is separate from this self-monitoring. If you've ever been in a situation where you're talking about something and a word comes out and you say, oh no, I didn't mean that, and you, you catch yourself. And so the language generation part of your brain was just gurgitating words and then another part of your brain was checking, do I mean that, do I mean that, do I mean that? And, and it, was, it, was, it was checking with it. Um, episodic memory is the memory of, of episodes, of events. Um, and that kind of thing turns out to be really important when you're thinking about the nature of dialogue and narratives and so on. Now, when we look at LLMs, things like ChatGPT, they have just these three parts of it and they're entangled together. So they don't have any of the, um, uh, the meta levels up at the top, and they don't have any notion of the episodic or situation. So for example, um, if you were to ask ChatGPT who's president, it doesn't really have any way to d tell whether it's Obama or Clinton or Trump or Biden, or, because they're all president. Like it doesn't have a notion of um, who is president now, who was president three years ago, or, or any, anything like that. Um, so the strengths of combining this is, first of all, language understanding and generation is off the charts compared with anything we've been able to do with computing systems before, like Knox Winograd schemas. I mean, it does better than human beings, typically, that those Winograd schemas. Um, the factual world knowledge is a, is a bit of a problem area for it because Remember, all it's got is these curves. It doesn't have any notion of fact, not fact. And so if you ask it about something, it will just use its curve to extrapolate what an answer probably is. And so I saw a great example of, um, and again, it's probably been fixed by now, uh, a year or so ago, somebody asking ChatGPT, um, what's the average height of the female presidents of the United States? And the answer was, well, there have only been four, so it's not been enough to say. And 
here are the four, and you know, listed four, including Hillary Clinton, um, as as the, and their heights, and then calculated that. I mean, you'd read that, and and I mean, if you didn't know better, you it, you'd believe it. And all it's doing is extrapolating based on this curve, because that's all it can do. It has nothing else to work on. It doesn't go back to let me check up a database of facts or, or anything like that. It just extrapolates from that. And so people talk about them hallucinating, which is a kind of fancy word. It's just extrapolating, actually. It has no notion of fact, not fact. It just extrapolates from the little bits that it knows and the prompt and, 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 and things like that. On the other hand, if it happens to know, if it happens to have been trained on a fact, then it, it, it can be really good at telling you those kinds of things. So, so the things it actually knows about is it's really good at combining. I have to say the thing I'm, I think, most excited about is this one in the middle, common sense knowledge. I mean, I don't even know how to describe common sense. It, but it's like, yeah, I don't know how to describe common sense. It's really hard to describe, but for the first time, we have computing systems that show something like, yet it feels it has common sense. Uh, and this shows up, for example, um, you can explain something to it, and it knows how to apply that in the way that if I explain something to you, you would know how to apply it. Um, it so it's able to do sort of extrapolation around the thing that you, you show it. So for example, you can say, um, I could translate this mathematical problem into this piece of Python code. And here's another mathematical problem into this piece of Python code. Now, could you do it for this third mathematical problem? And it will be able to say, oh, I get what you're doing, and it will, it will be able to do it. Um, and that's what I mean by a kind of common sense. And this is, I think this is a fundamentally new phenomenon that we have not ex exhibited in computer science before. And I think this, this is fascinating. But there's all of these other issues around. Now, the, um, it suggests that a path forward may be to at least separate, separate out factual world knowledge from this, not have that not built into the LLM, and start to build in these other capabilities for us to gain um, uh, more ability. So we want to disentangle the factual world knowledge from language and common sense and add the missing uh, modules. Um, so let's talk about some ways that we might think about doing some of that. I mentioned fine tuning. So one of the things that you do with fine tuning is you start out with a large language model that you've just trained on, on everything. And, um, and now you um, uh, want to tune it to a certain kind of behavior, like um, uh, be safe for work, you know, in terms of your output or, or, or things like that, or, or don't tell people how to destroy humanity, you know, th these kinds of answers. So what you do is you, um, you start out with um, uh, an LLM, ask it lots of questions, and you collect human ratings, like thousands and thousands and thousands of human ratings as to which of these answers is better, this answer or this answer, this answer or this. And so the human beings rate it, and you use that to build a, a, a model which describes the preferences as to how, whether it should go for one answer or another answer. And then you use that to take the LLM and you feed the learning back into the LLM itself again and again and again so that it learns those preferences in all sorts of situations so that it no longer swears, so that it no longer you know, does whatever you are trying to have it avoid uh, uh, doing. Now, it, what, it, what that does essentially is it masks some of that unsuitable behavior, but it doesn't actually remove it from the model. It's still there deep in the model, it's just not available at the surface. And that's why the jailbreaking sometimes works, because it gets around these kinds of barriers, it gets into that stuff, and once, it, once it's there, it just starts um, coming out, like when Jeff's had too many beers. Um, so the other problem is that um, doing too much fine-tuning um, can erode the underlying capabilities of the model. Um, so it, you can actually start, the model starts to degrade. So, so you can only do um, a certain amount. Um, uh, and, th and there's challenges. Human ratings of inappropriate reflects biases, reflects um, uh, politics, and so on. Um, here's another thing you might think about. So it turns out that LLMs are bad at answering basic physical questions, physics questions. Like if I have two things and I drop them, it might not know that they drop to the ground at the same time. 
um, even though they're of different masses. Um, uh, so it, it is possible to um, uh, tell it some of those things. Here's some facts that you might find useful. Um, uh, but it's actually quite interesting to um, uh, have a different LLM that, first of all, looks at the question and says, is there any specialist knowledge? In this case, is there any physics knowledge needed here? And it just extracts things to do with physics knowledge. And it gives it to a first wave physics engine, which says, here's a physics problem generate for me information which is directly relevant to this particular problem. Like, in physics, what would happen? That gets fed in as part of the input. And so now the um, uh, LLM has an augmented prompt which says things like, by the way, they will hit the ground at the same time because my physics simulator says they'll hit the ground at the same time. And now the LLM doesn't have to try and guess what the answer is. Um, LLMs do arithmetic, you, you may have, that, you know, what's two plus three, it says five, and they get bigger and bigger arithmetic. At some point, the arithmetic gets too big for them because they're, they're really just extrapolating on how arithmetic handles. And it turns out like, it's a bit like kids when they haven't quite figured out how to carry digits. And they're just sort of guessing approximately what, what happens. And LLMs are like that. But if you put a calculator in this situation so that it actually does the real calculation, ag again, the LLM uh, works, works really well. So it's very valuable to um, automate this. Um, and, um, and it turns out that if you do this, um, you can get much, much better answers. Um, the mind's eye, the one at the top, is the one which is um, uh, doing it with respect to the um, uh, with respect to the physics simulator. So it goes from being horribly bad to not too bad, um, which which is a significant improvement. It, it's not yet brilliant um, that that. Um, another way is you can actually um, train large language models to by themselves reach out to external tools. So it's a generalization of that previous idea where it's not doing the tool, you're not building the tooling ahead of time, but you start with a trained LLM and you fine tune it to be aware of when to use external kinds of tools and um, have it call out to, to different kinds of tools. Um, for example, it could call out to something that knows facts for knowledge-based problems. It could call out to something that knows mathematics for math-based problems and, and things like that. Um, so it turns out that you need about a billion parameters in your model to be able to have it generalize in, in that way. And, and so going back to common sense, I think this is, it's, this is a, at the stage where something like common sense is emerging, the scale at which something like common sense is emerging. Now, a billion parameters seems a lot, but it's way smaller than something like ChatGPT, which is 175 billion parameters. So we don't need all of that size, apparently, to be able to get the capability if we start using some of these third wave um, approaches. And uh, here's, I think, the final example I'll give of, of this kind of thing. Take the idea even further. What we'll do, here's the LLM, which has the outputs feeding back to the input. Um, and we'll use the input to search some um, uh, external database um, in order to um, get give me all the relevant things in this database that are near neighbors to the thing that you're asking about looking at. And so you can then feed that into the model to say, by the way, here's some relevant factual information. And what's cool about this kind of thing is that as facts evolve over time, you can start putting new, da new data in there. You're not having to train the basic system. You're just updating its knowledge with like what happened yesterday, what happened last week, th those kinds of things. So here's a, an approximation of, of what's going on at the moment. Um, there, was a, there was a sense in which the number of parameters was going larger and larger and larger. Palm 2 that was uh, released by Google just this year is interesting in that it's quite a bit smaller than the um, uh, GPT-4. And they claim that they can make it smaller for various reasons. In fact, their, their report on, on um, uh, how they think about it is, is very interesting to read. But you can see just the huge amount. I mean, these are billions of parameters. Think of them as billions of cells in your spreadsheet, like B with a billion, billion with a B. And, and the number of tokens, the number of words that, that have been read to train it is, is incredible.
So one thing I'd like to say just before I close is um, let's stand back and consider dimensions of, of risk. Um, and this is out of a recent report. So one possibility, if you put an LLM that is receiving stuff in your web page, you could have um, a denial of service attack against your system. That is thousands of requests, millions, zillions of, of requests coming at you. Usual denial of service problems. You could have prompt injection attacks. We talked about prompt injections uh, a, a while ago, of things that are intended to uh, get your LLM out of its safe zone into something that, that may not be safe. Um, the response, one huge issue of response is over-reliance on the output. Like, it told me this thing, I will believe it. I won't check it. And there was a news report um, a few months ago about um, lawyers who submitted court documents that had come out of ChatGPT and got into a huge problem because it had just made up court cases. Again, it, was just, it doesn't know whether the, the, it had no notion of truth or not truth. It, it was just extrapolating based on the shape of its curve. Um, you may have sensitive data in your LLM that gets exposed. Um, you may have other issues of unreviewed output. If you have some of these plugins where your LLM can call out to some booking system or something like that, you may have given it excessive capability. And so it may, it may move too much money from one bank account to another bank account or, or whatever. So, so that's a challenge um, to be aware of. And then in the LLM itself, there's a whole bunch of, of issues um, to do with the LLM. So don't think that these things don't come with cybersecurity problems because it's the same sort of kinds of cybersecurity problems just in their shape. So here's my final slide. This is a very active area. Tomorrow's issues will be different from today's issues. I think the three waves model is helpful. This first wave approach just by itself still has a lot to offer like, I don't know, science and math, for example. Um, turns out to be really quite useful. Um, the second wave is amazingly effective, but it has fundamental limitations that can leap up unexpectedly, um, and it has non-human failure modes that catch us by surprise. Um, I'll, I think that we'll see more and more third wave LLM architectures that are blending um, well-engineered knowledge with the statistical modeling um, and we still don't know how to best to properly integrate these. And there will be surprises as we do it, positive surprises, negative surprises. I think the, um, uh, the common sense aspect, as I've said before, is radically new. We've never had a phenomenon like this in computer science before. Um, and we don't yet know how to describe it or characterize it or how to use it or, or, or anything like that. But it's, it's, it's very exciting. And then this whole process of being able to integrate information from um, all sorts of places is going to have its own implications. I mean, it's related to common sense, but it's different from common sense. This ability, like, can I take this information and this information and this information and extrapolate them uh, together? Um, so I think this is going to continue to be an exciting space. I'm, I'm excited to see what we at Galois do in this, particularly with our focus on how do we bring trustworthiness in a system like this. And um, thank you.